your Bible, would you turn to Acts chapter number 2, and we're, gonna, we're continuing our series called Awaken, where we've been in the book of Acts, we're going to really just be in the first six chapters of Acts, and last week, you know, the first week we talked about being awakened by the Holy Spirit, then we talked about <clears throat> being awakened by and through leadership, and then last week we, we, we began talking about um, one of the things that I love um, about serving the Lord, and one of the things I love about just being a Christ follower is I love his church. I love the church that Christ came to establish. I, I love the church that Christ died for, and, and I love being a part of the church, his church, that one day soon and very soon he's going to come back for. I don't know about you, but I love the bride of Christ. I love his church. There's nothing like being a part of his church. It's not like a social club. It's not like a, just a gathering of people, but it's, it's an opportunity for us to dig in together and do life. And so we're talking about the church. And in, in Acts chapter number two last week, we just got to that first point that one of the things that the church had going for them is that they had physical signs. And we talked about how uh, they had the wind, which was an agent of movement. We talked about the fire that was kind of an agent of either purification or agent of destruction, depending on which uh, uh, direction or which way that, that you looked or what actually particular part of that fire that you needed in your life at that particular moment in time. And then finally we talked about at the end that the, the tongues was an agent of communication, that we are to communicate the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ in a language that we people, that people that we're ministering to and ministering with can understand. That we don't have to be all religious, amen? We don't have to be all high church and all high and mighty, but all we have to do is we're called to do life with people that we are, are in contact with every day, and we're called to bring the good news, the message of reconciliation, reconciliation with God and with man to them, Amen? So t- today we're going to be actually in uh, verses 5 all the way to verse 41. And what I want to do this morning is we're, gonna, we're not going to read the text in its entirety, but what I want to do is I want to just take um, chunks, if you will, of this passage and of this text because as I was studying that, uh, this, 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 these chunks of Scripture, I found that each chunk kind of speaks to something that we need to have in God's church today so that we can attract people and so we can draw people and, and to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. So are you with me? Are you tracking with me? Yes? So the church, Acts chapter 2, verse 1 through 4, have physical signs. But now when we go down to verse 5, we, we begin kind of a new chunk of Scripture. And it says, There were some Jews living in Jerusalem, Acts chapter 2, verse 5. It says, Devout men... From every nation under heaven. And, and I just want to stop there. So yesterday, actually last night, many of you know I, I'm a basketball nut and I love basketball. And, and I grew up, even though I grew up in southern Ohio, all my family's from the Kentucky area. My dad was born in the mountains. And, and so we, we went down to the mountains, you know, uh, many times during the year. And then my uncle happened to live in Winchester, Kentucky, which is the home of my favorite drink. And I thank God the favor of the Lord uh, shown upon me. I went and did basketball reffing yesterday, and somebody walked in and said, I got something for you, and said, uh, my son just got back from Kentucky, and we brought a bunch of extra L8 back, so we brought you some, and we're putting it by the scorer's table. I was like, praise God, hallelujah, the favor of Jesus, but my favorite drink. So I, I, anyway, I would spend my summers um, there with my, with my aunt and uncle and, and, and just hang out with them and, and, and dr- drunk ale late. It's the best ginger ale known to man. But uh, anyway, so I began to have a love as I was growing up for the big blue Kentucky basketball. And, and so last night they were playing and traveling to Morgantown, West Virginia, and I expected them to get stomped because they haven't been playing very well. And I watched the, you know, we went out and did some shopping when I got home later on and then came back. And when the kids got put to bed, I started watching on DVR. And the first 10 minutes were horrible. 10 turnovers in the first 10 minutes. They got down by 15 points. Then halfway through the first quarter, they cut the lead to like five. And then all of a sudden, by halftime, they were down 17 points. I expected them to lose, right? And by some act of God in the second half, God loves the Kentucky Wildcats. By some act of God. See, did you know that Kentucky, bluegrass, it's God's country down there. But it's a beautiful picture. 
that they come back, they go on a 20-2 to two run, and they ended up winning last night by seven points. It was something that I did not expect, and that happened, and I was amazed. And I was a happy camper last night. Just ask my wife. So they win, and it's like in our lives, have you ever had those moments where you go in looking at something a different way, in a different direction, and you didn't expect something to happen, and then something happened the way that you hoped it would, but you didn't think that it would, and you became amazed. Anybody ever have those moments? Well, in Scripture, let's keep reading. One thing that the church had that I, that I long for us to have again in 2018 is this, this amazement. Read with me. And when the sound in verse 6 occurred, the crowd came together together, And they were bewildered, or they were amazed, because each one of them was hearing them speak. Who's them? The the people, the the disciples, the apostles. They were, verse 7, say it with me, amazed. And they were astonished, saying, why not all of these who are, aren't they they Galileans? And how is it that we hear each one of them in our own language? And then we see that down to verse uh, 20. Again, we, we see this picture that they were amazed. Friends, whenever the gospel of Jesus Christ is shared, it should blow our mind. Right? Because this God, who was all God, chose to leave heaven to come down for a sorry sinner like me. Amen? And a sorry group of sinners like, amen, the trick you there. It's amazing. All the Father's love for us, how blessed beyond measure that he should leave his throne in glory and come down for us. And it was amazing, watch this, that he would even use these Galilean people. Because when you, uh, when you study the culture, that the Galileans, they were typically in the area or in the region of the Sea of Galilee, just outside one of those neighboring towns, just around the Sea of Galilee. There's multitude of towns, and, and just outside of Jerusalem. And they were looked down as just ordinary people. The Galileans, people, the, notice the, the shift in the scripture that we just read. D- d- we have devout Jewish men. Do you see that? These guys were the best of the best of the best. They can quote the Torah. They could quote all the commandments. They could quote the 500 extra commandments. These guys were the best of the best, but yet they were amazed at these ordinary Galilean people. Friends, it's about time that God uses your life and uses you to speak the message of the cross that will blow your family's mind, that will blow and amaze your coworkers, that that when your coworkers come in and then you stop right there in your office and say, let me pray for you. And they said, this has never happened before. It's amazing. You know, when when I used to go to my boss's office and, and, and share a need, they said, you know what? We're on work business and you're getting paid right now. We don't have time for that. But yet you stop and you get on your knees and you pray and it blows their mind and they're amazed. Are you with me this morning? It was an amazing, it was just an amazing moment that these devout Jewish men, they, they, they came expecting one thing. They came to the celebration of the barley harvest and then suddenly, that's how God works, suddenly when you least expect it, you try to plan it out and you try to organize it and you try to outline it, but then God comes suddenly into your life and he moves and he blesses you and you're amazed. I don't know about you, but he amazes me every day of my life. I was driving. Some of you might have saw the picture. I was driving on the turnpike, and all of a sudden, I looked at my rearview mirror yesterday morning, just a little after 7 o'clock, and I see this beautiful sunrise in the rearview mirror, and I was amazed. And I stopped on the side of the road. 
And I get out and I leave my truck open. I go back and I take a picture because it reminded me about the amazing hand of God. And if God can create a beautiful picture in the sky, imagine what he can create in you and in your life and in my life. That's the kind of God that we serve. He's amazing. That's for somebody this morning. You need the amazing God to amaze you. It was amazing, friends. The church and Acts was amazing. They were amazed. Then we go down to verse 12. Go down to verse 12. And they continued in amazement. In other words, these devout Jewish men, if you track it out, there was there normally in Jerusalem, population in Jerusalem at this time before the before the feast, before the harvest, before Passover, would have been somewhere between 30 to 40,000 people. Scholars tell us that during Passover time and during feast time in Jerusalem, Jerusalem swelled between 150 to 220,000 people. Are you with me? And these people, they came for one thing, and God showed up. Friends, would you just invite somebody to church? They're going to come for one thing or another. But then when they show up, they're going to be amazed because God wants to do something in them. And they don't even know how to explain it. They say, I was compelled and something brought me here. And then I was sitting there and the message was going forth. The songs were being sung. People were sharing their testimonies. And all of a sudden, something got a hold of me and I was amazed. And, and I just couldn't be, I couldn't let go of it. And I've been coming ever since. Maybe that's some of your testimony. You don't even know, you went to church because your parents drug you to church. And then you've been coming ever since. Because something grabbed a hold of it. It's amazing. Do you believe that this Jesus. God is amazing. Let me just share with you the third thing. Not only the church of Acts had physical signs, not only was the church of Acts amazing, but, but go down to Acts chapter 21. <clears throat> this is our next chunk. So actually, in verse 14, Peter gets up. <laughs> I love Peter, too. This guy that just, just, just would speak out of turn all the time, right? Right? Lord, Lord, you're not going to wash me. You're not going to wash my feet. Lord, Lord, you're not going to die and you're not going to go back to heaven. You're not going to do all this stuff. Lord, who's the betrayer? You're talking about the betrayer. Who is it? Always questioning. Lord, if it's you, let me come to you. Let me walk on the water like you. And then he begins to walk on the water and then he falls flat on his face and he's almost dead. But yet God picks him up. He denies not once, not twice, but three times. And then he's on the seashore and yet God restores Peter. And yet this same Peter... I don't know about you. It's amazing that God can use people like Peter. But he can. It's amazing that God can use people like me. It's amazing that God can use people like you. But, but here's the thing. It wasn't about Peter. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's not about Eastside Community Church. It's not like whatever other church you want to put the name on. But, but the church in Acts was founded on Jesus. Because Peter gets up and starts speaking a sermon in verse 14 of Acts chapter number 2. And then when you go down to uh, verse number 21, look at the sermon. He says, It shall come that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now verse 22, Men of Israel, listen to these words. And he starts off his sermon with three words. Jesus the Nazarene. And then he preaches this sermon all the way down to verse 36, therefore, in other words, he's wrapping it up. Let all of the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ. See, Jesus is not just your Savior. Jesus is not just your Christ, the one who saves you from your sins. But Jesus demands that he is your Lord. He is your master. He controls your life. See, we don't like the word control because we want to be in control. But Jesus doesn't want to just rescue you, but Jesus wants to hold on to you. I don't know about you, but I, I think I'm preaching pretty good this morning. He wants to not just save you, but he wants to hold on to you and do life with you and carry you. You know the old hymn of the church? And he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me I am his own. And the joy we share as we tarry, as we gather here, no other has ever known. That's because Jesus wants to lead your life. 
In other words, the church was founded on Jesus, and Jesus wants to be the center. He doesn't want to be just, just some, some wheel out here, but Jesus just want to, doesn't want to be a spoke, but Jesus wants to be the center of the wheel. He wants to be the hub where everything else is tied to. Everything else is surrounded by. Jesus wants to be in your mix. Jesus wants to be in your business. Say, Jesus, don't be up in my business. He wants to be in your business. (laughs) It was founded on Jesus. Write this down quickly. This sermon that Peter preaches, I'm going to give you the outline of the sermon quickly. A, the sermon, Jesus, it says Jesus, in verse 22, Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested. In other words, that word attested, just a fancy word for this Jesus was given to you. This Jesus was provided to you. Did you know that God saw your need before you even were born? And he said, I'm going to send provision and I'm going to make a way where there is typically no way. And I'm going to provide. Jesus was attested by God. Point B in this Peter sermon. Jesus was put to death with lawless Roman hands. Acts chapter 2 verse 23. It was predetermined by God to be his purpose and the foreknowledge. And Jesus' death and the Roman soldiers' involvement, the government's involvement, they could not deny. So Jesus was put to death. So point A, Jesus was attested. Point B, Jesus was put to death. Number three, point C. Oh, this is a good one. We sang about it this morning. Jesus was put to death, but point C, Jesus was raised from the dead. In verse 24, but God, see, he didn't raise himself up. God raised himself up again putting an end to the agony of death since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. The translation there is it's impossible for Jesus to literally be held in the grasp and in the holds and in the bondage of death. And you might feel in bondage this morning, but if Jesus is in you, that means you need to be lifted up and raised up to sit with Christ Jesus in heavenly places. People can try to hold you down. Bondages and, and sins and addictions and, and hurts and habits can try to hold you in bondage. But that same Jesus. Oh, i got to say that again. But the same Jesus that was raised from the dead is that same Jesus that is in your life and that same Jesus that wants to raise you up to be with him. Point D, Jesus was exalted. And we just read it, verse 36, as both the Lord and the Christ. Peter in this sermon, presented Jesus as a good man who was crucified, who was buried, who was raised from the dead, and now is exalted as both the Lord and Christ. See, we got to understand and we need to live every day in view that Jesus was the one who lived, he was the one that died, and he was the one that was resurrected, and that he is the one that ascended and is now sitting on the right hand of God the Father. We need to acknowledge all those elements of Jesus because those elements of Jesus have a factor and mean something in our lives today. If Jesus didn't die, it's all in vain. Either Jesus, as C.S. Lewis said, Jesus was either a liar or he was a lunatic or he was really the Lord. He was really who he said that he was. He, was. he made all these claims but yet every claim was backed up. Prophecy after prophecy after prophecy, fulfillment after fulfillment of fulfillment, and there's one that's yet to be fulfilled, but I guarantee you that I take it to the bank this morning that he will come back just like it was prophesied, and he will come back as he said that he was, because God is not a man that he should not lie, and the Bible says that God's word will not return unto him. Isaiah, I believe, 61 says his word will not return unto him void, but it will accomplish everything that he's intended for to accomplish, thus saying saith the Lord, was founded on Jesus. Number four, verse 37 through 39, Acts chapter number two, and I'm almost, I'm winding it down. That means I got another 30 minutes left. (laughs) Acts chapter two, verse 37. Now, when they heard this, 
you need to underline this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the disciples, Brethren, I find this very interesting because these same devout Jews, and I don't have time to tell you about what that really means and the devout Jews and all the different cultures and all the different, but it's very interesting when you study it out. I find it very interesting that these devout men, these Jewish men that are, that, that, that are about the Old Testament, that have nothing to do with Jesus, that don't believe that Jesus is the Messiah, that don't believe Jesus came and was who he said he was, but all of a sudden they have a change of attitude and Peter starts preaching about this same Jesus who they crucified, who they probably were standing by the cross, who were lining the roads as Jesus was going down the streets of Jerusalem. These same devout men who, 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 who didn't acknowledge Jesus, who, who, who they were just absent-minded and one-minded. They were just God, 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 and that's all that they, it was just Hebrew God. But I find it very ironic and very interesting that all of a sudden they had a shift. And they refer to Peter, who they, why are these Galileans, who they look down on. All of a sudden they said, brethren, God's going to take people who are your enemies. And he's going to give you favor with them. You know what I find it interesting? Is that that people that don't like you sometimes. All of a sudden they wouldn't get into crisis. They call you up. Would you pray for me? And I'll take it. Because they know. They might not act like they know. They might not talk like they know. But when you're living like Christ around them, at some point in time, they're going to have a need. And you just hold on and you live your faith. And you walk and talk and act like Jesus. And all of a sudden, those highfalutin people, those devout people, we, we, we call them uh, Christers. They only come to church on Christmas and Easter. They're going to come and say, Brother, sister, and don't push them aside, but say, what can my Jesus do for you? And they said, brethren, look at this, brethren, what shall we do? In other words, there was something bigger than them that got a hold of them at that moment. In other words, friends, the church of Acts initiated a response. When we share the gospel, people can do one of two things. Actually, three things. They can, they can reject it. They can accept it. Or sometimes they will hear the word, and they're, they're, it's going to take time for them to process it. That's why the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6, <clears throat> the apostle Paul said, I've planted, Apollos watered, but God gives the increase. Can I just tell you what my prayer is for this church? That for all those many people that down through the years, since the first church of God was started, maybe in the 20s, and since Eastside Community Church was started in 1966, and then when the two churches came back together and became one again, I just have a radical prayer. That all those people, that down through the years, the church cast seeds and sowed the seeds. And then down through the years, the many people came and watered and watered. I'm praying, Lord, would you send the increase? Because what you you have to notice, and I'll share here in just a minute, the Bible says in Acts that the Lord added to the church. You and I can't add to the church. We can just plant, and we can just water, and we can just sow seeds. But I'm praying that those dear brothers and sisters, even the many that's passed on before, and I don't know them all. I haven't been here that long. But I pray that the, the seeds of the sister branch combs and the seeds of, of, of uh, brother Jim Gailey, I, I pray that the seeds of brother Joe and sister Joyce Kreiner's parents, Brother Joe's dad, I pray that those seeds, that those generations, are you hearing what I'm saying? Those that are still around Muskogee, I pray that those seeds, friends, that you as parents have planted 
and, and that you've watered in the seeds of your kids as your kids were growing up and you were sharing faith, I pray that those seeds would at some point take root and bloom. And that those kids, would you be praying for your kids and your loved ones to know Jesus as Lord and Savior? And, and I'm praying that at some point you're going to date a text message from your son or from your daughter or a phone call. And, 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 you're, and they're going to call you and say, what's wrong, baby? And you're, they're going to say, I don't know what's going on. What should we do? The church in Acts initiated a response. Friends, you can pray and pray and pray. But you got to keep praying. Because at some point, your prodigal's coming home. Your prodigal's coming home. And they're going to be like this, these devout men. What shall we do? You know that word, that, that Greek word I had you underlined, pierced to the heart. That Greek verb, it's a verb, it's not a noun, it's a verb, it's an action. As it initiated the response, the Greek word here, means to pierce, <clears throat> to sting sharply, to stun, and to smite. In other words, it's the Holy Spirit's work of convicting people of their sin. I'm going to say that again. It's the Holy Spirit's job to convict people in the human heart of their sin. It's not my job. I'm just a delivery boy. See, no, notice, we, we got, uh, we, man, we've been eating a lot of pizza lately. And, and, and so we all have our favorites. <clears throat> but notice when that pizza is delivered. Whose job is it to deliver it? It's the delivery boy, right? It's not his job to cook it. It's not his job to box it up. It's not his or her job to answer the phone when you call. They just deliver it. Friends, our job is to deliver it. Deliver it in your life so that you can deliver in other people's lives. The church in Acts initiated a response. Let me give you these last two. <laughs> this one is my favorite, but well, one of my favorites. Go to Acts chapter number 2, verse 40. Read it with me. <clears throat> Brother Tom, this is a great scripture for preachers right here. Acts two forty. And... With many other words, and I'm going to stop right there. Underline that. With many other words, the church of Acts, Peter's sermon. See, I, I gave you the outline of the sermon, but then <laughs> sermon part two. The church in Acts went over time. <laughs> Get that on the screen if we can. The church in Acts went over time. I want you to see it. I didn't realize last week I preached 53 minutes. I went some overtime last week. But friends, you guys were, were eating. You guys were up at the table. And you guys, man, I, I, I appreciate that so much. But friends, it's okay. We need to be busy about the Lord's business, right? Man, I, I, I refereed some basketball yesterday. And one of the, the second of the sixth game that I did, it went overtime. It went into extra period. See, y'all go to a football game or you go to a hockey game or, or you go to a play or something. To act. You don't mind it going overtime, do you? Because you're getting values worth. Friends, we shouldn't mind church occasionally going overtime. I'm going to say that again. We shouldn't mind the church occasionally going overtime. I'm going to say that again. We shouldn't mind the church going overtime. I'm going to say it till everybody says amen. I shouldn't mind the church going overtime. Can, can I give you a hint? Don't plan your after church gatherings at 12 o'clock on Sunday afternoon. Hello? <laughs> Hello? Because we don't know what God's going to do. <clears throat> hey, man, family member, tell you, I'm at the restaurant waiting for you. Will you just order me something because we're going overtime and it feels so good? Hey, man, I want you to get your time's worth, man. See, that's what the wind that God wants to do, that the Spirit wants to just come and blow. Because you never know, there might be one person in this sanctuary that morning that needs an extra touch of the Lord. The church went over time, and the Bible says with many other words, he began to testify, he began to exhort, he said, save yourselves, you perverse and crooked, not straight generation of people that cared more about religious pomp and circumstance than a true relationship with the Jesus Christ. 
This morning, are you willing to go over time hearing the word of God and studying the word? See, it, man, uh, uh, sometimes it's, it's about turning off that TV and getting into the word. Amen. Amen. I know that's not, 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 not. Pastor, you're meddling. Well, praise God. Amen. Went over time. Let me give you this last one. <clears throat> and I alluded to this a little bit ago. Acts chapter 2, verse 41. And if you come next week, I'm going to preach verse 42 to 47. That's my only text next week, so you can start, start studying that up. Acts 2, 42 to 47. I'm going to preach on those five verses. I'm going to preach overtime. Hallelujah. You guys gave me permission and affirmation. We're going to do some overtime next week. Hallelujah. Glory to God. The church in Acts made, verse 41, and the Lord added to the church 3,000 souls. So then those who had received his word were baptized, and that day added about 3,000 souls. The church made kingdom impact. What was the outcome? The results were phenomenal. About 3,000 people were added to the small group of 120 that were in the upper room in Acts chapter number 1. Can you, can you imagine that? 3,000 people. Did you know that the, 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 the synagogue couldn't contain them? That's when the first idea of multiple services came into place. Because they couldn't contain them. You got 220,000 people in Jerusalem. And you had 3,000 added to the church. Of that 3,000, there was some of those devout men. Those devout Jewish men. Friends, I don't know about you, something that blew my mind, and I'm not, never going to forget it to this day, was when I, went into, when I was in Israel, and when, when we would get on a bus, not our charter bus, but um, when we were staying in Jerusalem, some of us went out and found which bus went down, like in, into Jerusalem itself. And it was about 11 o'clock at night, and we ride this bus, we exchanged our money at the hotel, and we go down to go see the, the Wailing Wall all lit up, a magnificent sight. And I see two things going on at 11 o'clock at night. People are at the wailing wall praying. Putting their prayer request inside the nooks and the crevices of the wailing wall. But then I even seen more. That these young Jewish kids. They, they get on the bus. And they have their, 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 their Jewish garb on. Their tassels. And they get up on that bus. And they're walking with their Hebrew text. And they walk, they get on the bus, they, they slide their card, and they're reciting the text. They come down and they sit down and they recite their text. Remember, in the book of Deuteronomy, it says, to teach your kids. Are you with me? To write the commandments of the Lord on their heart. Friends, how are we teaching our young people to get into the word? And they were walking down the city streets. And I'm guilty. I'm preaching to myself. They were walking on, their, on the city streets. They weren't messing on that phone. They were messing in the scriptures. And they were walking and getting the word, God's word in their heart. God's word have I put in my heart that I shall not. Yes. And friends, when we do that, when we are about kingdom business, we will make kingdom impact. This morning, I just want to challenge you as we stand this morning, as we stand. I don't know about you, but, but this, I want to be a church that has signs all over it. I want to be a church that's amazing. I want to be a church that is about a Jesus church. It's not a pastor church. Friends, we make, we make church about pastors. Friends, pastors come and go, but Jesus is always there. Can I just, can I say that again? We may, and I'm not going anywhere, Lord willing, but pastors come and go, but Jesus is always here. Are you with me? The Apostle Paul told his followers, follow me as I follow who? Jesus. Don't follow me, the man, because I'm going to fail you. There's going to be some, I'm going to say something, or I'm not going to call you back. I'm going to hurt your feelings. Not, in, not on purpose. Are you, are you getting what I'm saying? But don't follow me. Follow Jesus. Jesus will never leave you. Jesus will never fail you. And I want to be a church that, that responds, helps people respond to the gospel. I also want to be a church that, <clears throat> if 
we just affect one person and, and, and we're going over time, it's worth it all to me. Because I want to be a church that makes kingdom impact. Friends, I want people, when they drive by this church on Peak Boulevard every day, I want them to say, hey, that's a church that's making kingdom impact. That's not a church that's about themselves. That's not a church that's about whatever. It's about that's reaching people and that loves people. Amen? Would you just pray with me?